It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After the podcast, check out everything ChristianQuestions.com has to offer. Also see our weekly video series releases at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Now, here's your hosts, Rick and Jonathan. William James once said, whenever you're in a conflict with someone, there is one factor that can make the difference between damaging your relationship and deepening it. That factor is attitude. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. Joining me as always is Jonathan, my co-host for more than two decades. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. So, Jonathan, what is our topic for today's episode? Well, Rick, our question is, can biblical strategies resolve serious conflicts? Part two. And our theme text is found in James chapter four, verse one. What is the source of our quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Okay, so can biblical strategies resolve serious conflicts? So, coming up in today's podcast, look, let's be honest. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie is with us today. I almost forgot Julie. Hello, Julie. How can you forget Julie? I can't. (laughs) Nobody (laughs) can. Uh, Hey, on our last (laughs) conflict episode, that was number 1144. You know, we talked a lot about conflict, but less about the resolution. So on this podcast, we need to get to the practical side of resolving conflicts in a God-honoring way. Yeah, you know, if I didn't remember her, there would have been a conflict that would have needed (laughs) resolving right here. Anyway, coming up in today's podcast, let's be honest. When you have conflicts in your relationships, isn't it really easy to just blame the other person because they're wrong? Well, we're going to talk about this in about 15 minutes. Do you just get tired of people who have opinions that are foolish? How should you handle them? Isn't it easiest to just be done with them? Well, answers on these vital questions and issues in about 30 minutes. And finally, what's a healthy way to deal with the feelings of wanting to see someone we have a conflict with suffer? Don't miss this part of the conversation coming up in about 50 minutes. But first, let's start at the beginning. Conflict is everywhere. This is not necessarily a bad thing, as proper conflict management at every phase of our lives provides some of life's most fertile growth experiences. The problem is we're not taught how to manage our conflicts. In part one of this two-part series, we listed and discussed the five degenerating stages of conflict. We saw plain evidence that we generally approach our conflicts with personal opinions, preferences, passion, and a desire to win. What tends to get overlooked are the solid, emotionless principles of truth and righteousness. If you look at the social and political conflicts in our world, you will see the sad and chaotic results of such an approach. So how do we turn the tables? As Christians, how do we rise above the fray and manage the conflicts before us with godliness and grace while firmly standing for what's right? The answers here are straightforward, they're sound, and they're scriptural. So what we're going to do today is look, relook at the five degenerating stages of conflict by way of review. We're going to do so through the lens of James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, where James is giving true Christians remedies for things to avoid. And folks, if you're following along with us and you've got your Bible, open up to James chapter 4, 7 through 10, because we're going to keep going back there. So Jonathan, let's get started. Let's put that scripture on the table, and then let's develop this thing. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Okay, in that scripture lies answers to all of our stages, these degenerating stages of conflict. We're going to take that scripture, we're going to come back to it throughout the podcast and apply the pieces of it, and you're going to see how incredibly wise James' uh, admonitions are here. So, Julie, we've got these five degenerating stages of conflict. What's the first stage? Because that's actually the best stage. 
That's the remedy stage. And that's where the desire is to fix the problem. And we all have a commitment to fix that problem. And we think it can be solved. And here we've got honest communication. Okay. You're committed. There's communication. It's a place where you can remedy a problem. 80 to 85% of conflicts can be solved at this stage. So this is where you want to live when you have conflict. Okay. But this is where most of us don't even visit, unfortunately. To be focused on remedy is to be prepared to communicate and act based on principle. While this is obviously the best way to manage any conflict, it's also the easiest way to do it when we decide to begin here. Okay? We have to begin here. So what we... Did we do A, B, and C? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> that's okay. See, he doesn't want any conflicts with this thing, so that's, that's good. Right. <laughs> so, you know, the easiest thing to do here is, is, is you, you want to start here. And, you know, it all comes down to principle. What are principles? Julie, talk a little bit on principles. The thing about principles is that they do not need a lot of emotion behind them. They simply need room to be recognized. Simple. They don't need emotion. They need room so they are recognizable. We'll expand on that as we go. Let's go to a soundbite from Julia Dahar. She did a TED Talk on how to disagree productively and find common ground. This was an awesome TED Talk. She really nails a lot of things. She's talking about how to have an, a, a debate, a real debate that is actually productive. And we're going to drop in on her conversation on this uh, periodically. So first, we're talking about just the fact that we just generally agree disagree. Some days it feels like the only thing we can agree on is that we can't agree on anything. Public discourse is broken. And we feel that everywhere. Panelists on TV are screaming at each other. We go online to find community and connection, and we end up leaving feeling angry and alienated. In everyday life, probably because everyone else is yelling, we are so scared to get into an argument that we're willing not to engage at all. Contempt has replaced conversation. Ouch. Contempt has replaced conversation. Very, very important to understand. And that's why the remedy stage is where things can actually happen. So as we go through resolutions, and Julie mentioned earlier that we're going to focus on how do you resolve conflicts in a scriptural way. We want to give a conflict response reminder. Each time we come across one of these degrading stages or degenerating stages of conflict. So, Jonathan, what's our first conflict response reminder? Where do we find it? In James 4, verse 7, and it says, Submit, therefore, to God. Okay, we're going to pause right there. That's the first part of verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Now, that sounds like a simple little thing. But think about it in terms of when you're in a conflict, what do you do? The first thing you do is you try to submit to God. There is something powerful about that. To submit is to subordinate, to obey another. The only way, the only way for a Christian to resolve any conflict before them with godliness is to be in complete subordination to God's will. That's how we need, as Christians, to approach our conflicts. So the question is, how is this submission to God reflected? I think one practical way our submission is shown is not to raise our voices and keep calm. And for me, I think the only reason you don't agree with me is because you must not have physically heard me. So I'm going to say it very loudly, and I'll keep getting louder to get my point across. But I have to remember that this intensifies the argument. And if we're shouting, we're not really listening, so we aren't really understanding the other person, and it becomes quite a mess. But isn't what I say more important? Because I just interrupted you, didn't I? Well, I did, I did that kind of in a funny way, because interruption... When you're interrupting someone and they're talking, it's rude. And unfortunately, I have to work on that myself because my wife reminds me that oh, I interrupted no. again. So uh, <laughs> interrupting is also not uh, really a proper way to communicate. So 
these are two very common, regular, everyday human responses. Raising our voice, you know, maybe you didn't hear me. I'll say it louder and interrupting because, okay, maybe you didn't hear me. I'll talk over you and say it again. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't help us with resolution. They, 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 they have exactly the opposite, opposite effect. And we're going to see that as we go through the degenerating stages and the solutions attached to them. So we need... We get these reminders, okay, submit to God. Well, how do you do that? We're going to call the how-to of these reminders response points. So, Julie, what's the response point here? Speak the truth in love. And we get that from Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by every joint, supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And, you know, submitting to God, taking our place as a member of the body, not being the one who always has the right answer. And that word love there is the Greek word agape, that unconditional sacrificial love that God has. <clears throat> but one of the Bible commentators gave a quote from Howard Moody Morgan. He's a minister, and he was in discussion with his brothers about what the best Bible translation is. And he said, well, the translation I like best is mother's translation. And what he meant by that was his mother's Christian life. He believed that she translated biblical truths into Christian living. And that is an illustration he used of what the Apostle Paul said about speaking the truth in love. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I like that. You know, I'm looking at a living example of godliness. That's, that's the best right. translation of Scripture. You that's know? right. And, 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 and again, my Uncle Steve used to always say, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Uh, be that example. Speak the truth in love. So Yes. And I'm going to interrupt you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just like we were just taught not to. And I've got a quote from our friend Carl Hagensick. He said, Peace may not come by achieving agreement, but by gaining respect for each other's reasons for holding their position. So we don't always have to have that complete agreement, but we still have to have that respect. And I really like that quote. All right. So it is a mutual respect thing. Speak the truth in love. Now, what if we're not met with a godly response by those with whom we have conflict? What if we're giving a godly response, but we're not met with it? Well, we had told you already to, to keep your finger in James 4, 7 through 10. I'm going to ask you also to look at Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, because we're going to ask this exact question every single stage of conflict, and Romans 12 is going to give us always the right answer. So Romans 12, 9, Jonathan. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. There you go. Love without hypocrisy abhor what's evil, cling to what's good. It's not enough to just abhor evil. You have to cling to good as well. So, And here's a, here's a profound way to summarize that. Don't move off of who you are supposed to be. Yeah. We want to be the person that we promised God and Jesus we would be. Be that person. So if we're being yelled at or we're being demeaned, this normally would give us permission from a human standpoint to yell back even louder but that's not the godly response. It's a human response. So don't move off who you're supposed to be. And that brings us to our conflict response remedy. So the remedy with conflict at this stage, which is actually the very best stage, is going to be a, a very straightforward statement of what we can do with the position we're in. Go ahead, Jonathan. I have powerful influence over how my conflicts are handled. Therefore, I will continually submit to God's will and way as I communicate with love and understanding. You know, Rick, we have a choice to make. Um, the, either the conflict we can use as a tool and a growth experience for everyone or not. You know, it's really, it's up to me. And that's the point. The whole point here is it's always up to me and my influence in this conflict as to how I represent godliness or my own human frailty. And really, those are the only two choices that we have. So we got to be careful with that. Look, as we deal with such a tough issue, the idea of having powerful influence for good is a breath of fresh air. How do we keep our heads and hearts right when we feel the need to point the finger of blame? 
Did you know we have one page companion Bible studies for our most recent podcast episodes? Listen to the episode, follow along with our CQ Rewind show notes, and for your own bite sized Bible study or group study, check out the Bible study questions content. Go to ChristianQuestions.com and click on Bible study in the main menu. Have some study time and then contact us with any additional questions or comments. Now let's continue the conversation. Ah, pointing fingers. This is where the several battles to achieve godly approach to conflict management begin. Even though many conflicts can still be resolved with the blame thing on the table, we need to stave off the downward momentum that blame brings. And my friends, this is not an easy task. Now remember, when we point our finger at someone... You know, we have three fingers pointing back at us. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Didn't you learn that when you were a little kid, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, but some of the lessons you learn as a little kid are the most powerful lessons that we can actually carry with us as we go through things. Okay, so we had the, the, the easiest, the best stage, the remedy stage of conflict. Well, what's the second degenerating stage of conflict? Julie, go ahead. Well, this is the repositioning stage where we're looking to see, well, who caused this problem? And in this stage, people are nervous. They're starting to get defensive and a little protective. And there's a lot less trust in this level. And our communication starts becoming more cautious. All right. Now, only about half of all conflicts that get here can be resolved. So you can see that we're not in a good position already. We're at a 50-50 shot. So as Christians, we have to pay really close attention if this is where we are. It's easy to slip from the idealism of resolution, that was the first stage, into the compromise of repositioning as resolution is hard and selfless work. Yeah, resolution is hard and selfless. It's selfless because it's not about my opinion, it's about godly principles. The whole thing always revolves around principles. Julie, what what about principles? Okay, well, it's the same thing that we said in the first segment. Principles do not need a lot of emotion behind them. They simply need room to be recognized. It's a simple statement, but and it's a refrigerator sticky note statement. Just realize that principles don't need flair. They just need to be able to be recognized. Let's go back to Julia Dar with her TED Talk on how to disagree productively and find common ground. People who disagree the most productively start by finding common ground, no matter how narrow it is. They identify the thing that we can all agree on and go from there. What they're doing is inviting us into what psychologists call shared reality. And shared reality is the antidote to alternative facts. The conflict, of course, is still there. That's why it's a debate. Shared reality just gives us a platform to start to talk about it. First of all, I, I love her accent, and I wish <laughs> I could, I wish I could imitate that. Um, but you know what she's telling us is really the goal of peace is unity, not necessarily uniformity, and we have to remember that. And I've got a great quote: "In essentials, unity; in non-essentials, liberty; and in all things, charity." And that quote is by Peter Merdelin. He was back in the 15, 1600s, and he's an Irenic Lutheran theologian. And according to Merriam-Webster, Irenic is an adjective meaning favoring, conducive to, or operating toward peace, moderation, or conciliation. The name Irene is derived from this word. So we want to be Irenic. We want to be pursuing peace and moderation. All right, ironic, not ironic, but ironic. That's right, ironic. <laughs> that's that's actually that's that's pretty cool. The idea of just look for the way to find the common ground. So, with this in mind, the conflict response reminder, Jonathan, where does it come from? It's in James chapter four, verse seven. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See now, you know, in in, in the first segment, the the response reminder was submit therefore to God. Okay, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to submit to God, but that means there's other action involved. And so James is saying the next action is resist the devil. So you've got to look toward God, but then you have to resist the devil as well. Just because we begin with an attitude that's submissive to God doesn't mean we're safe. We also need to resist the devil, to stand against and oppose him. This keeps our conflict management attentive to resolution and not fault-finding 
and gaining the upper hand because we're in the repositioning stage looking for who caused the problem. And when we get here, James is telling us, resist the devil, resist the devil. Make sure that you, that you, 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 you draw nigh to God and you resist the devil. So how is this resistance to Satan reflected? Well, response points to help us remember how to practically apply this. Julie, there's two here. What's the first one? Instead of blaming, seek to understand the other's point of view. And here we need to examine our own attitude. Are we interested in peace or are we interested in proving ourselves right and others wrong? So instead of blaming, seek to understand the other's point of view. Okay. Make sure we're understanding that point, other point of view. Jonathan, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4, and then verses 7 through 8. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as it were a sacrifice to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. So you've got a conflict there between two perspectives. It's not a principle. It's a conflict between two perspectives. But the point is to understand the other's point of view and why do they hold that particular perspective. So getting back to the James scripture, we resist Satan when we go to the next level to understand those with whom we have conflict. See how it ties together? It's understanding those with whom we have conflict. That's how we can make progress and get out of this finger-pointing stage who caused the problem. So, Julie, we said there's two response points. The first one is instead of blaming, seek to understand the other's point of view. What's the second one? Instead of blaming, seek common ground. And I've got another quote from our friend Carl. He said, Try to find a method of expression to which both parties can agree, noting that substance is more important than words. Okay, substance is more important than words. Principle, that's what we're talking about. That's right. Jonathan, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 11 to 13. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Peter, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? If we pay attention to what the other person is saying and really listen, we can find a way to be unified. You know, if we pay attention and we decide we want to be unified, we may not be agreed but we can be still unified. Principle is central when we seek our highest common ground, not the lowest common ground, the highest, reaching out and focusing on principle. One other quick point about this scripture, you know, the, the, the issue was some were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. Well, you know, the idea of being I'm of Christ, that is the right answer, because they were all supposed to be of Christ, but they were giving the right answer with the wrong attitude. They were giving the right answer in a divisive way. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm of Christ, so there. Instead of being of Christ and not even getting into the argument and saying, brethren, aren't we all the same? Aren't we all of Christ? See, there's a huge difference between saying, well, I'm of Christ, or aren't we all of Christ? That's how you stop pointing fingers and start resolving things. So, all good. But what if we're met with an ungodly repositioning response and this second degenerating stage of conflict by those with whom we have a conflict, okay? What if we're not pointing fingers, but somebody is certainly pointing fingers our way? What do we do? We turn to Romans chapter 12, okay? Flip over those verses, listen to verses 10 and 11, and hear the gentle power of a solution. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving ourselves. Uh, no, I, I mean serving the Lord, oh, <laughs> not yeah. ourselves. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, I it's, thought that scripture sounded yeah, funny. I was like, what? <laughs> what translation? That wasn't mom's translation, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well. Hey, when we know we'll be in a situation where we need uh, to discuss a conflict, it helps to mentally rehearse the discussion. Imagine the conversation and how we want to respond to the other person and how our words make us feel. 
it may help to practice so our response will be godly. Oh, I love that idea. It's like we visualize the reaction to the possible points of contention and we may not overact to those hot buttons that we have. You know, we all have those things that provoke us. And if we can kind of rehearse it ahead of time, Jonathan, that's a really good idea. So rehearse the idea of responding without emotion, but with principle. That's the thing. Because you know what? It's one thing to practice. You know, we've heard the saying, practice makes perfect. But it might not. Because if you're practicing the wrong thing, you're going to perfect the wrong thing. Perfect practice is what makes perfect. Practice being principled in these things. Just go about being the most mature Christian you can be. Understanding can overcome obstinance. It's really that simple. Uh, You know, I wanted to read a paragraph written by our Christian friend, Larry McClellan. He states things so beautifully. He says this, as Christians, we are a royal priesthood under development as a means to an end. Christ and his church are the means, whereas restored humanity in the kingdom is the end product. Will we not have a few human conflicts to resolve in our kingdom position if faithful? How about billions of conflicts? We are a people for a purpose. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation as described in 2 Corinthians 5.18. So consequently, we will be and are even now in the personality business. Doesn't God want to see an effort on our part to apply our training for this position? Yes, there's many qualifications for our future position of service, but this component of our heavenly report card may have greater value than we perceive. How do we use the lessons of the wisdom from above, James 3.17, and the principles of righteousness to make sound choices of conflict resolution in our relationships? Knowledge exercised in wisdom empowers proper choices and is not most of our life about the choices we make along with their cause and effect relationship. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. You got you to gotta check out the rewind to get that whole content there. But the key thing in that is, you know, the ministry of reconciliation means the ministry of being able to solve conflicts. If we can't learn to solve them here, how are we going to be able to solve them there? That's really what, what Larry was saying there. So we need to really focus in on these things. So Jonathan, as we wrap up this segment, what's our conflict response remedy? I have powerful influence over how my conflicts are handled. Therefore, I will, based on godly principles, continually be understanding and patient as I seek the highest level of common ground with those I am in conflict with. And we need to repeat the right things, the powerful things, the uplifting things, so we don't let anger creep in which would make Satan very happy. Yeah, and you know, and there's there's some that we don't want to make happy, and he's at the top of that list. So you're making these conflict response remedies uh, statements. They're powerful, affirmative statements of godly intention, and they're stated in a very strong, un, unyielding way so that we can get into our minds what it means to actually stand for principle. As we explore the diffusing of conflict, the picture of being like Jesus comes more and more into focus. The easier steps are now in place. How do we deal with strong, judgmental, and angry emotions? Our YouTube channel has a lot going on. Go to ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Featuring new releases every week. Check out our playlists like CQ Kids, Moments That Matter, and CQ Bible 101. Plus, we have even more new series content planned to roll out soon. So stay tuned at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Getting our heads and hearts right to appropriately deal with conflict is so much easier if we don't let ourselves get out of hand. As we now get ready to deal with the harder stuff, we'll see that the effort to rise up and respond with Christ-like grace is going to be significantly more challenging. And talking about being like Jesus, check out our CQ Kids videos, How Can We Be More Like Jesus, Parts 1 and 2. Go to christianquestions.com slash YouTube. Okay, so now we get to the next stage of degenerating conflict, and it is not a good stage, and they get really a whole lot worse as we go. Julie, what's the third stage? This one's called the right stage. 
In other words, I'm right <laughs> and you're wrong. And in this stage, here's where people take sides and they are labeled. In a Christian environment, the other side might be labeled as too worldly or deceived. And in this stage, you're in a mode to win. Communication becomes distorted and overstated. And so now you're into the sarcasm thing, the labeling thing, and it, it's already been decided. So you, and about 15 to 20 percent of conflicts can be resolved here. So the ability to resolve is really, really, really reduced. So how do we get there? Well, when we're comfortable with placing blame in conflict, the previous stage, it's not too difficult to degrade into the black and white approach of I'm right, you're wrong. Opinion feeds emotion, and it's now about me. And you know what happens? We forget principle. Julie, what about principles? All right. We should have this memorized by now. Principles do not need a lot of emotion behind them. They simply need room to be recognized. You're repeating yourself. That's, that's right. So let's, we should have this memorized. It's a simple statement that helps us to put it in order. And that's why sometimes repetition is such an important thing. Let's go back to Julia Dar with her TED Talk, How to Disagree Productively and Find Common Ground. But the trick of debate is that you end up doing it directly, face to face across the table. And research backs up that that really matters. Professor Juliana Schroeder at UC Berkeley and her colleagues have research that suggests that listening to someone's voice as they make a controversial argument is literally humanizing. It makes it easier to engage with what that person has to say. So step away from the keyboards, start conversing. I love the fact of listening to someone's voice actually humanizes the situation and the argument. Sometimes uh, when texting or emailing, words can be taken the wrong way. We can't see the expressions on someone's face or hear the inflections or tone in their voice. That is why in person or hearing a voice on the phone is so important. Whenever someone does not understand what you say in a text or an email, pick up the phone or get in the car and go have a face-to-face -face discussion to avoid conflict. You know what? There's such power in that. Go see them. And, you know, I, I've had experiences where something went wrong, went awry, and, and begged to be face-to-face. -face. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But, you know, the idea is to let, let's humanize the person with which we have conflict. So to be able to do this, conflict response reminder, Jonathan, is coming from James again. What a surprise. That's right. With, Chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Okay, now that's a simple statement. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, you know, we resisted the devil, but that's not enough. You've got to go away from the devil, and then you've got to move in a different direction. If you don't move toward God, you can't solve the thing. And if you're in the I'm right, you're wrong stage, you have to draw near to God because it's the wrong place to be. Principled response in conflict is not easy or natural. We draw near to God by way of prayer, following scriptural teaching, and um, accessing his spirit. In so doing, we consciously move off of our self-centered approach and onto a clear God-centered approach where his wisdom can shine through us. Man, what a picture that is. How do we then take this personal closeness to God and reflect it in our conflict management? Julie, what's the response point to help us make that James scripture, draw near to God, he will draw near to you, practical? Make your desires and expectations clear. All right. Make what you expect clear. And again, if it's principally driven, it's a really good thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and then verse 5. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So you see that the apostle was very clear, making his expectations clear. He said, look, it's all about focusing on Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Okay, so we've got to ask ourselves, do I have the attitude of the Apostle Paul? Can those with whom I have conflict see me, see Rick, as solely representing the power of God through the example of Jesus as I lay out my expectations? Are they seeing something principled, or are they seeing Rick's preferences? Because if they're seeing Rick's preferences, Rick is wrong. Simple as that. We need to be principled so that we can stand higher than these things and not get into this 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 fight of I'm right and you're wrong. All good, right? Well, it, it, well, I think we can also be honest without being accusatory. You know, okay. and, and being once once we become accusatory, that really can take things to a to the bad level. Yeah, and so it's okay to disagree. That's what you're saying. That's right. You, and in the honesty of the disagreement, you, you have to be careful as to how you present it because when we start going after the person, we lose the principles. You know, you just you, the, the wrong thing is in your, in your heart and in your mind. So now, okay, so what if you are being principled in this right stage, this I'm right, you're wrong stage, but you're met with, on the other side, that ungodly right stance that's focusing on you saying, boy, you're wrong, you're really dumb, and all of that. What do you do with that? What you do is you turn to Romans chapter 12 again, verses 12 through 16. Listen to how these verses unfold a resolution for such a difficult point. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. What about the way we say things? I love Proverbs 15 verse 1, and it says, A soft answer turns away wrath. And Jesus Jesus warned his followers that they would be treated unjustly. You know, Matthew 10, 22 and Matthew 24, 9 um, both tell us that. So we're, we're not always going to have that other person with the same mind, principled mindset that we do, where they want to come together and, and negotiate this in a, in a righteous way. And so what's the surprise that we end up in conflicts that degrade? See, there should be no surprise. But the surprise, folks, the surprise should be, when we don't go play that game. The surprise right. should be when somebody decides to stand above and not enter into the I'm right, you're wrong, not enter into the finding the blame and all of that stuff. That's where we want to live. Do not waver and meet sarcasm or emotionalism with like response. Persevere in humility. That's what Romans said. Rejoice in hope. Persevering in tribulation. It's hard to have conflict that's not going well. But it doesn't mean you give up, and it doesn't mean you give in, and it doesn't mean you do what they do. You stand for what's right. What's our conflict response remedy here, Jonathan? I have powerful influence over how my conflicts are handled. Therefore, I will, based on godly principles, patiently reject looking to assign blame in a conflict and instead be clear and factual as I pursue godly resolution. So again, a clear, concise statement of intention that says, I have power in the conflict that I'm in because I'm in it. I have a voice. The question is, am I going to use my voice to reflect the voice of Jesus or am I going to use my voice to reflect my own preferences or opinions or, 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 or feelings? What am I going to use my voice for? I will, based on godly principles, patiently reject assigning blame. Am I going to actually do that? That's how you want to know how to resolve conflicts? This is how. This is not easy. It's not easy. So we've got this third stage, this third degenerating stage of conflict, the right stage, I'm right and you're wrong, but it gets worse. So <laughs> Julie, what's the fourth stage? Ah, oh, this fourth stage is bad. It's the removal stage where we say, get rid of those people. And now our goal becomes getting them out of our lives through divorce or argumentative disunity or resentful disassociation. And we really have no solution other than to get rid of them. And there's no communication because we don't have any trust anymore with these people. 
then we know that there's some scriptural reasons to separate. We talked about this in the previous episode on this, that Romans 16 and Titus 3 describe, but that's not what we're talking about here. Right. No, we're talking about a conflict that has degraded to such a point where now it's just get rid of them. I just, I just can't stand the look of them anymore. And folks, that's a sad thing, especially if that conflict we're there and it's with our own family members or with our congregation members. If we are in those kinds of conflicts and we're having those kinds of feelings, we have got to stop and reconsider where we are. Because I'm right and you're wrong. Remember now, we, we, we talked about that was a previous stage. Once we get to the I'm right and you're wrong stage, it's easy to rationalize the removing of the opposition as, as a viable remedy to the conflict at hand. Because we've, we've already stated they're wrong, so well, why not just get rid of them? We've now ceased reaching for truth, and we just want to win. How sad it is to just want to win here. You know what happened? We lost all of our principles. Julie, what, what about principles? Ah, oh, come on. I think everybody <laughs> has this written down by now. If they don't, here we go. Principles do not need a lot of emotion behind them. They simply need room to be recognized. See, the whole point of saying that again and again and again and again and again is to make the point that just to state a principle doesn't, you don't have to have this flowery approach that has got all kinds of passion behind it. State the truth and give it room to be recognized. That's what we got. We have got to try to do. Is it going to change other people? Maybe not. But so what? You're doing the right thing, and that's really what we next we need to do here. Always do the next right thing. Let's go back to Julia Dar and her TED Talk: How to Disagree Productively and Find Common Ground. And once we're inside this shared reality, debate also requires that we separate ideas from the identity of the person discussing them. So in formal debate, nothing is a topic unless it is controversial, that we should raise the voting age, outlaw gambling. But the debaters don't choose their sides. So that's why it makes no sense to do what 10-year-old Julia did. Attacking the identity of the person making the argument is irrelevant because they didn't choose it. Your only winning strategy is to engage with the best, clearest, least personal version of the idea. That's exactly what we're talking about by stating principles. The least personal version of the idea. The conflict should not be about how I feel. It should be about what's right and what's wrong. Focus on ideas rather than the identities of the people involved and you can actually make progress. But when you're at this stage, this removal stage, this is really, really hard because maybe 1% of conflicts can be resolved here. That's it. It's an awfully difficult place to be. So, Jonathan, we are, we're at this stage, and it's hard and it's miserable. What's our conflict response reminder of what we should be doing when we're in this mess? And again, it's found in James 4, verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, draw near to God, you you, you push away from the devil, right? You resist the devil, you draw near to God, and when you're drawing near to God, automatically what should be happening is the purification of our hands and the purification of our hearts and the purification of our minds. When you're drawing near to God, that's what you are naturally going to need to do. We must keep both what we do and what we're passionate about clean and pure. It's not about not being passionate. Nobody's saying don't be passionate, but be passionate in a principled manner that is completely righteous from God's standards, not ours. Because you know what? Human righteousness and godly righteousness, two very, very different things, okay? You can't fit them in the same conversation. Failure in these things results in double-mindedness, which serves Satan, not God. End of statement. You don't want to be there. But folks, we end up there very easily when we get to this removal stage. And we've all been there before, okay? And it's not good, and it's not godly, and it doesn't ever solve anything. As a matter of fact, it puts a knife further into your relationship with that other person and makes it harder and harder to find future common ground. So how is this attention to purity? 
James just told us, cleanse your hands and so forth and so on. How is this attention to purity reflected in our conflict management? We've got two response points, Julie, here. Let's go with the first one. Stay focused on the issue at hand. So we want to remember it's the issue we're talking about, not the person or how irritating and wrong they are right now in your opinion <laughs> or how you feel about them. Keep it keep it principled. Keep it without any type of malice or disrespect towards them. You know, and, and, and we look at that and, and people can say, well, you know, come on, really? Do you have to do that? And the answer is yes. Yeah, we do. Why? Because that's what the scriptures tell us to do. If you want to solve conflicts, go to the scriptures and here's an idea. Listen to what they tell us to do. Let's look at, Jonathan, let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. This is in Antioch with Peter and Paul. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So there's a lot in this verse. First of all, Peter lost sight of a very important issue. He lost sight of the vision that he himself was given, of the, the fact that you know, the, the, the Jewish rituals were no longer applicable to Christianity. He was personally given that vision, and yet, and he was living according to that, except when in the company of certain ones, and then he, he wavered, and he went back to the other way. And he was presenting an inconsistent perspective, and he was hurting those around him. So the Apostle Paul stayed on point and said, you can't do it both ways. You have to stand for something. You have to stand for something. So stay focused on the issue at hand. Paul was very clear. He didn't, he didn't uh, you know, attack Peter personally. He said, this is what you're doing. Don't do this. Do that. You know, you of all people know, this is the righteous thing to do. See, presenting God's truth must be our unwavering top priority, contrasted with the fleshly desire to minimize and remove, because this stage is all about removing. Focusing on what is most important is the only way to do this. The only way. So we've got this response reminder from James, cleanse your hands, you know, get yourself in, in line with godliness. The first response point was to stay focused on the issue at hand. Julie, what's the second? Maintain direct communication. That means no third parties. Okay, let's go to Matthew 18, verses 15 and 16. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Now, Rick, based on this verse, this is talking about sins, not disagreements or small problems, right? Right, right. And the principle is the same, but this is talking about sins. The principle of dealing with the issue personally is the very, very, very most important thing, but you're right. It's talking about sins, not just preferences and, and different, different perspectives. And this part of the 18th chapter of Matthew, it's a pretty famous part of this chapter. It's all about the three levels of correcting your brother who sins against you. The first level is private. You just go to that brother. The second is a small group where you bring one or two with that to that to that issue. And then public to the rest of the congregation, but only after the first two don't bring out the recognition and repentance process of the sin. So Jonathan just read about the first two levels. And that's going to start preventing evil surmising or evil speaking. And of course, before we do that, we want to ask ourselves whether our motivation is to glorify God or are we seeking for our own satisfaction? Yeah, yeah. And you know, when we seek for our own satisfaction, what do we look at? We listen to hearsay and gossip. Well, look, it's easy and tempting to listen to hearsay and gossip, but they never help resolve conflicts. And that's not fleeing the devil. That's not right. listening to those James scriptures. That's not clinging to God. So right. that's where we're starting to go off the rails. Right. That's not clinging to God. That's not cleansing your hands. That's not purifying your hearts. That's not 
putting away double-mindedness. It's exactly the opposite. Right. So we have to avoid those things. Always respectfully deal with the source, directly with the source. You want to actually resolve a conflict that's really degraded? This is how you do it. Folks, it's hard, but it's worth it. It is so worth it. Okay, now what if you're met with an ungodly removal stance by someone? You know, they want to remove you. You're trying to be as godly as you possibly can. How do you deal with those who are like, no, you're an idiot. I'm getting rid of you. You go to Romans chapter 12, right, Jonathan? Romans 12, 17 and 18. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know, I am amazed at how the scriptures in James and the scriptures in Romans, James 4 and Romans 12, fit exactly into these degenerating stages of conflict. And they show us exactly what to do at every single spot that we get into. All we have to do is listen and apply and have the courage to stand for something bigger than ourselves. So Stephen, we remember Stephen, you know, the the first Christian martyr. He responded to his angry opponents with scripture and history. The result was his faithfulness to God and their demise into a murderous act. And we're going to actually touch on Stephen in the next segment. So Jonathan, let's wrap this up. We what's our conflict response remedy for this stage of removal? I have powerful influence over how my conflicts are handled. Therefore, I will, based on godly principles, not fear the irrationality of others. I will stand above such rash reactions and never waver from standing for principle. You notice the power of the statement. It is, this is what I will do. It's not, I'm going to try. The statement is, I will. Why do we make that statement so firm? Because that's the ideal. That's what we have to strive for. We cannot strive for, well, let me do the best I can. No, you, you strive for that perfection of the response. And if you fall, it's okay, you're striving. You get up and you try again. You know, the further we go with this, the harder and more important it becomes to stand for pure godly principles. One stage of degenerating conflict left to conquer. What are our most powerful take-home lessons? It's been a privilege and exciting interacting with our listeners all over the world. Reach out to us anytime at ChristianQuestions.com. In addition to always continuing the conversation on our website, in social media, and our YouTube channel. Learn more about becoming a Christian Questions ambassador. There are several impactful ways you can help us continue to spread the gospel message. Go to ChristianQuestions.com and click on Support CQ in the top navigation menu. Join our incredible team of volunteers and find out more. Now back to Rick and Jonathan. Before summing up, we absolutely need to observe the vile and senseless potential results of mismanaging our conflicts. God's plan gives humanity the opportunity to see sin unfold in all of its ugliness as a lesson for eternity. So let's see mismanaged conflict as that same type of eternal lesson, because we've all mismanaged conflicts in our lives. So let's look at the lessons from it so we can learn not to go there again. Because again, we are ministers of reconciliation. Our job is to learn how to reconcile people who have conflict. We had better start in our own lives. So Julie, almost hate to go here, but what's the final degenerating stage of conflict? All right, this is a stage that no Christian belongs at. This is called the revenge stage, where we want to make someone pay. And this is really the sorry end result of godless thinking. And in this stage, people turn into fanatics. They fight a religious war. And it now it becomes almost immoral to stop the fighting. They're they're going to go down no matter what. Right. You're going to go down with the ship. Even if you shouldn't have never been on the ship, you're going down with <laughs> That's it. That's right. And, and it's sad. It's a really sad thing. Look around us. Look around you. Look at the social world. Look at the political world. And tell me you don't see a lot of this. Okay? This is how we're taught to deal with conflict. Can you see the folly of this? Can you see the, the, the damage that it does to all of our relationships? The moment we give into getting rid of those with whom we have conflict, the previous stage, revenge, this stage, appears logical and important. We trade away 
their value in exchange for the elevation of our own ego. That is the sick trade. Our opinions, preferences, and passions have made a mockery of the godly principles we once aspired to uphold. And this makes me think of the scribes and Pharisees that were threatened by Jesus' words and his influence over the people. They schemed to get rid of him. This definitely fits the revenge stage. It does. And it's a sad, sad testimony that we have in Scripture. And folks, the question is, is it a sad testimony in my life? Have I gotten to the point where I've lost my grip on principles and just gone down this horrible, horrible path? Julie, what, just, just, you know, I might, you, I oh. think you might have something to say about <laughs> principles. What is it? One last time for our special phrase to memorize. Principles do not need a lot of emotion behind them. They simply need room to be recognized. Just get your head around the principles that we need to look at and then state them. It doesn't have to be a big dramatic thing. State those principles, live those principles, and you can actually have a positive effect on the conflicts that you face. Let's go back to Julia Dar one last time in her TED Talk, How to Disagree Productively and Find Common Ground. And it's interesting. She's talking about having debates. We're talking about conflicts. They're two different things. But the principles that she talks about directly resonate with everything that's happening here. And this, this soundbite we're calling the humility of uncertainty. And then the thing that debate allows us to do as human beings is open ourselves, really open ourselves up to the possibility that we might be wrong. The humility of uncertainty. One of the reasons it is so hard to disagree productively is because we become attached to our ideas. We start to believe that we own them and that by extension, they own us. But eventually, if you debate long enough, you will switch sides. You'll argue for and against the expansion of the welfare state, for and against compulsory voting. And that exercise flips a kind of cognitive switch. You, the suspicions that you hold about people who espouse beliefs that you don't have starts to evaporate because you can imagine yourself stepping into those shoes. And as you're stepping into those, you're embracing the humility of uncertainty, the possibility of being wrong. First of all, the possibility of being wrong for many people is very scary because it means by extension that they are somehow inadequate or not good enough. And you know, one thing that struck me in studying these five stages of conflict resolution is that when we're going through it in real life, we certainly aren't methodically thinking about all these stages. It's kind of like an elevator that just zooms straight to the boiler room. <laughs> yeah. And the purpose of this podcast is to force ourselves to really stop at every floor and slow it down so that we stop that plummet that goes downwards. Yeah, you know, and that's a, that's a really good illustration because it's too easy to go down the slide and end up at the bottom and just be hateful and resentful and angry and, and ruinous to the relationships that, that we once had. And we have to rise above that. Oh, look, sometimes there is a right and, and, and wrong. And we're not saying, you know, you, you give in to wrong so you can, you can save, you know, save and make everybody feel better. Making everybody feel better is not what we're talking about. Standing for principle in a godly, righteous way is what we're talking about. And I think a lot of people don't even get to stage one and two. Yeah. They end up going right for stage three and they zoom down to four and five and it's over. You haven't fleed from the devil. You haven't turned to God. You haven't done anything that All right. you're supposed to. Right. So now that we're down at that final bottom rung, if you will, our conflict response reminder, Jonathan, I can't imagine where it comes from. James 4, verse 9. <laughs> Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. So if we have gone down that rabbit hole and now we are being that angry with others, James is saying, be miserable, mourn, weep. Don't have joy in the destruction of others. If we slip away from principled conflict resolution into selfish thinking and actions, we need to repent. We need to deeply repent for misrepresenting the cause of Christ. 
Jesus was mourning over Israel and their leaders, and he said in Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chick under her wings, and you were unwilling. So Jesus was feeling compassion over those that were against him. So think about that. Not only if we have been doing the wrong, should we be miserable and mourn and weep, but if wrong is being done to us, are we willing to feel that depth of compassion that Jesus felt for those who were doing such wrong? And they murdered him, and yet he had that kind of compassion. That's the example. That's conflict resolution. That is being a minister of reconciliation. Jesus showed us how, folks, we need to follow those steps. So, okay, we have this miserable, mourning, weeping, repentant attitude. How is this repentant, God-centered attitude reflected in our conflict management? Well, we've got two response points on this to help us make it practical. Julie, what's the first one? We want to listen and try, try, do not respond defensively. You know, combative people will always feel like retaliating, and that might be part of our character. But those who have learned self-control and meekness, they're going to know that you don't render evil for evil because being defensive might cause us to lash out physically or with verbal attacks or gossip or slander or even trying to ruin someone professionally or financially. You know, they become a bullseye, and that becomes your focus. That's your focus. Guess what's not your focus? God's not your focus. Right. Right, right. You've lost everything. So listen and don't respond defensively. And let's go into the context of the stoning of Stephen and listen to how he responded to certain death. Acts, we're going to go from Acts 6, 11 to 12, and then right into Acts 7, 1 and 2. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. The high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. And then Stephen went on to preach the gospel to them. He just went in a kind and loving way, showed them their own history, how it all led to Jesus. It was a beautiful, beautiful testimony. His response to the vengeful treatment he was receiving was only focused on God's plan. He stood while others stooped. They stooped down literally to get stones. Stephen stood for principle by kneeling in prayer, and he died, and God gave him glory because of that, because he sought to resolve the conflict with all of the right things, and he paid the ultimate price. Or did he? You know, we say, oh, you know, he died. Yes, but he lives. So it's an amazing, amazing example. What's our second response point? The first was listen and don't respond defensively. Julie has a second way to, to get this, this, this revenge stage riding that ship. Make a commitment to what is in everyone's best interest. Okay, this is simple. Not my best interest, everyone's best interest. Listen to the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Those of us who profess to walk in Christ's footsteps, we should be the most polished, the most refined, the most polite, the most generous, the most kind of all people in the world, and not just as an outward appearance, but as true gentleness and kindness coming, because we are supposed to have that appreciation of God's spirit of love. And that's what our profession is. And that's where earlier we said, don't get knocked off that that goal. Don't get knocked off. This is what we should do is have this fidelity to Christ because that's in our best interest. See, gentleness and kindness is not weakness. And too often it's looked at that way. Oh, you know, gentle and kind. I can step all over them. Because if our gentleness and kindness is Christ-like, it means there is powerful truth principle behind it. 
and we are to stand for that, whatever the cost may be. As Christians, the ultimate best interest that we can have in mind is, like you said, Julie, fidelity to Christ. There is nothing else, and it's not weak to be kind, because that kindness should be driven by principle, should be driven by the fact that you do stand for something, and it's something that's above you and beyond you because it is biblically driven through Christ from God's Word. So, okay, so we've got these, it's great, right? Listen, don't respond defensively, make a commitment to what's in everyone's best interest, that's all well and good. But what if, at this horrible revenge stage, you're met with the ungodly revenge response and people want to drag you off, okay? But what do you do? What do you do with that? Well, you know what I'm going to say. You turn to Romans chapter 12. And again, I am, I am in awe of how amazingly these scriptures fit into this whole story. Romans 12, 19 to 21 at this revenge stage. stage. Guess what it says? Well, they don't have to guess. Jonathan, just tell us. Never... Take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I guess that's there's enough said. <laughs> what a beautiful uh, example that is. Now, now the phrase um, "heap burning coals on your head" refers to a time when keeping one's hearth fire alive was a life saving necessity. If someone could not keep their fire going, then he would go around the town carrying some sort of container on his head, asking for hot coals to rekindle his fire. Putting coals in this container on his head would benefit him fully and and help him. Paul is saying to pay kindness to your enemies instead of trying to hurt them. So no vengeance. If someone's taking vengeance on you, do not take vengeance on them. As a matter of fact, treat them with kindness and godliness. Stand for the principles of what Jesus was all about. So Jonathan, our conflict response remedy here is what? I have powerful influence over how my conflicts are handled. Therefore, I will, based on godly principles, stand in the midst of conflict for godliness and the appropriate treatment of others, no matter what they may seek to do to me. Okay, again, another powerful, clear statement of godly intention. Is this something easy to do? No. But is this something that we are contracted to do? Yes. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And if we're walking in his footsteps, this is how we want to model ourselves to manage this revenge stage of conflict. Be not afraid, because it is God's providence that can guide you through this. And you know what? It may not turn out well for you. Not here, not now. But if it's in God's hands, the eternity is what you're really focusing on. So, Jonathan, there's one final conflict response reminder here as we now begin to wind this whole thing up. And where does it come from? James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves in the presence of God. He will ex- it's, it's not about me exalting me. It's about him. It always comes down to being a humble follower of Jesus. It's not about winning the conflict. It's about humbly wanting to express our concern. And when it's over and done, pause and consider the experience. And here's one final response point. Always reflect to discover and apply what you have learned. You know, self-correction versus pride is a pitfall for all of us. And we want to be ready to apologize as hard as that can be for our own actions and gulp, admit (laughs) where we were wrong. And this reminds me, Real quick of Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So this idea of always reflect and to discover and apply what you've learned. Look at your experience learn something from it, and then you realize what Romans 8, 28 
really means. You know, a lot of Christians quote Romans 8, 28 as, wow, this is just, it's inspiring. No, this is life changing. It's not inspiring. It's life changing when we actually apply it. Jonathan, what does it say? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It says God causes all things, the hard things especially, to work together for our good because we are called for his purpose. We're being trained to be ministers of reconciliation. That means our job will be to manage conflict in a godly way. So, Jonathan, we've talked about conflict um, uh, remedies, uh, uh, response remedies. Well, now our final conflict resolution conclusion, the last final powerful clear-cut statement. What is it? I have powerful influence over my conflicts and how they're handled. By standing in principle and standing for Christ, I will strive to be the light of the world no matter how much pressure I feel. You know, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Do not hide that light under a bushel. You have to let that light shine. And when conflict comes, that is when the light really needs to shine and be a part of who we are. You know, when you're dealing with conflict, folks, and you apply these principles, somebody should not be able to tell the difference. This is ideal, of course. Ideally, not tell the difference between you and the principles that you stand for because you are selflessly presenting godliness. This is hard. This is difficult. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes practice. It takes failure. But so what? We all have conflicts, and we all need to work at putting ourselves in a Christ-like position so we can make the conflict have a resolution and give people a witness to what godliness really looks like in a world that's completely lost all semblance of God. Conflict resolution is possible. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode or other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our program is subscribing to Christian Questions in iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast channel is, please rate us and review us. We'd greatly appreciate it. Now, coming up next week... Do I have other gods and idols in my life? We're basically talking about the first two of the Ten Commandments and what it means to us here and now. Talk to you next week.